remember the storm where Jesus was sleeping uh, there in the boat and the disciples said, Lord, don't you know you're gonna, we're gonna perish out here? And, and uh, Jesus calmed the storm there in Matthew chapter eight. That was lesson number one, stormology or class number one, stormology 101. Well, this is stormology 102. Uh, that is the second storm they're gonna face. And uh, it's during a time that's starting to become sort of tense. Um, do you remember how you felt when, remember when the coronavirus and lockdowns all started happening and we were washing our groceries and everybody was kind of freaking out? And then we had the fires on top of that. Remember all the fires? And then, you know, the, the sky was bright red in the middle of the day, but it was dark and you had to have your headlights on. And I remember just, there was kind of a feeling of like, wow, what could be worse? You know, like everything's just getting, people were dying, they were saying all over the place. And it was like, ah, oh, what's going on? But, um, you know, I think once in a while it's good for us to have those moments when we realize, oh yeah, we live pretty comfortably most of the time. And we, we don't really appreciate it, you know, until something seemingly is kind of a problem or bad. Um, and, and we don't have a lot of empathy for people that are going through tough things. Um, but, uh, but I think those are the moments where we realize, yeah, there's, you know, trying times, it can be difficult. But you gotta put yourself in the disciples' sandals uh, in this story. Already Jesus, their leader, well, the Sanhedrin, the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they want him dead. That's a problem. If the government wants your leader dead, that's a problem. I'm sure they're feeling that weight. And, and not only if they want Jesus dead, I'm sure the disciples in the back of their minds are thinking, do they want us dead too? Um, not only that, um, so the, the religious leaders are already plotting to kill Jesus. Um, a lot seems to be going wrong. You know, they weren't really seeing Jesus take the kingdom like they probably, some of them thought he was gonna do. Uh, but he seemed to be almost like, in some ways, weakening rather than taking over. Uh, he was just, you know, traveling around talking about stuff. And I wonder if they were kind of thinking, when's he gonna show us the stuff, the power when he takes over from the Roman Empire? But that wasn't really his objective. Uh, they didn't really even know really who Jesus was at this point. Um, they're still learning that. They're, they're not gonna really fully understand who Jesus is, I think, until you know, once he's resurrected, once Jesus died, was buried, rose from the grave, ascended into heaven, I think they started to go, okay, now we know who Jesus is. Um, but during these stories, they're still wondering what in the world's going on. And I think that you can almost picture them being in a troubled sort of situation. And it reminds me now that they're, not only they're troubled, but now what could be worse? They're in a boat in a storm thinking they're all gonna die. Well, what could be worse? Well, then they're gonna see a ghost. They think that they're, they're being haunted now. What could be worse? Well, Peter jumps out and almost thinks, like, like things are just looking, things are looking kind of bad right now for the disciples in some ways. But I have to say, um, the reason I love these stormology stories of the Bible is because we all go through times of storms and seasons of darkness and waves and wind and sinking and stuff like that. Maybe you feel that way right now. Um, you know, we're, we're in an interesting place nationally as a country or even globally as the world goes. Inflation is a global problem right now. In the United States, we're experiencing it to kind of a, a whole new level, inflation. Our gas prices are as high as they've ever been. Um, you know, there's a recession, but nobody really wants to admit that it's a recession. Uh, we have supply chain issues. I mean, it's funny that in our lifetime, there's things that you could once buy that you can't buy right now. If you wanna buy a brand new Ford F-250, uh, good luck. Uh, there, there are no uh, really new ones around. And man, you're, you're, if you want to buy an F-50, you got to pay, you know, a, a u get a used one for the more than it was than it was new. Uh, when did it become hard to buy a pickup in America? Uh, well, right now. Uh, and we've had other issues, supply chain with the, you know, the, um, you know, uh, er everything from tech technology and computer stuff to, you know, the, um, the, the milk for the babies. What do you call that stuff again? Yes, formula. I was, I was lacking the word there, formula. <laughs> um, um, uh, you know, uh, we're more divided. If there's one thing the election showed is that our, our country's more divided than ever. Um, crime is on a huge wave right now. War around the world, but, but not just war. Like, um, this is the one that I think is under um, acknowledged or, or, or even people aren't concerned at all. It seems like they're not concerned about it, but the threat of nuclear war is very real right now. Um, the experts say this is as bad as the Cuban Missile Crisis, but nobody wants to kind of acknowledge that. As Putin just a few weeks ago said he was, you know, signing in 300,000 new troops, and he said to the world, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be able to use nuclear weapons if I want to, and this is not an idle threat. That's what he said. That's a major leader of the world. The only people that have as many nukes as, as uh, you know, Putin is the United States. 
But then the, the, the idea of nuclear war, we know that's a lose-lose situation. Mutually assured destruction is what has kept people from using those weapons up until now. But it seems like that's looming right now. And, you know, these storms that we have life that we go through in dark times where the wind's blowing and the darkness and the waves and all that stuff, we learn a lot from these lessons. How do we navigate through the storms of life? And, and I'd like to take a look at this uh, a little closely at Matthew 14, 22 through 33. It'll help us out as we're living in dark, stormy days. Check it out, verse 22. Um, it says, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. I love this. This is a reminder of that overwhelming truth of the Bible. Uh, it says this in Romans 8, 28, and we know. And the question is, do you know this? Because this is something the Bible sort of says, we all know, we know this. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Um, and, and we know that, and it's easy in hindsight, but when you're in the middle of the storm, like these disciples, sometimes you kind of think, oh man, uh, is the Lord working this for good somehow? Well, I believe it always works that way for the believer. Um, that's something to, as we begin this to, to, to sort of make note of. But we've covered 12 verses of a story, and one of the things I like to do, um, maybe you could try this uh, at home as a good exercise, is when you're reading the Bible, there's various ways to read the Bible. Sometimes I just read the Bible in larger chunks, and I'll read you know, three or four or five chapters or a book of the Bible, um, and that's fun. But sometimes I'll read through it more in a journaling way where you kind of read a verse and then write some thoughts and read another verse and write some more thoughts. Like that's a fun way to do it too. And um, in some ways I wanna sort of break down this story in that fashion. Um, there's 12 verses and I have 12 points, 12 lessons. You're like, oh great, 12 lessons. This is gonna take forever. No, we're gonna go through these fairly quickly. Um, but uh, I'd like to break this down because this story has so much we can glean and I'm not even gonna scratch the surface tonight. Uh, but let's go through the 12. Are you guys ready? Uh, here we go. Number one, the first thing we notice here from this lesson is the mission. Uh, I, I hear the Mission Impossible music going in the background as we speak. Uh, there in verse 22, Jesus uh, constrained his disciples to get into a ship to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. The mission, get into your boat. Now, don't forget the word ship. You're all picturing the Queen Mary pulling up to the shore there. And the, no, it's not a big ship. It's uh, the better word translated there is boat, uh, just, just uh, for, for the record. Um, but notice the wording here um, where it says he constrained his disciples. I like the way the uh, ESV puts it because it's, it's perhaps more uh, linked to the way we would say it today. Immediately, he made the disciples to get into a boat and go before him to the other side while they dismissed the crowds. Um, he made them? Well, remember, he's their leader. He's the one in charge. And so he made them. The word constrained in, in the King James, it comes, really the original word uh, there is kind of an interesting Greek word, and it's very affirmative that it's uh, anankadzo is the, is the word there where he says he constrains him. And this word anankadzo means to necessitate, to compel, to drive to by force. Like Jesus sort of forcefully says, guys, get in the boat, 
Go to the other side of the sea, I'll meet you over on the other side. Um, that's the mission. Jesus gives them a mission. Um, now, one thing about missions is they often are met with peril. When you go on a mission, uh, that's usually like a, a book or a movie about missions, military mission operations and stuff. There's usually peril looming. And that's kind of the idea. The Lord says, I want you to get in a boat, go across. But, um, but when missions are met with peril, one of the things you have to remember is something we learned a few weeks back. Remember when we were talking about, let's see who listened. God's commandments are his what? Enablements. When, when Jesus commanded the disciples to say, go to the other side, that's as good as done. If Jesus is the one, now if I go tell you to do something, uh, my commandments aren't necessarily your enablements. You may or may not be able to do what I'm asking you to do. But when Jesus, who knows, knows all things, says, I want you to do this and go, and you're gonna go to the other side of the, the sea, then that's as good as done. You can put your trust. His commandments are his enablements. Um, now, I can easily say, sitting here comfortably in Athe Creek, uh, you know, saying they should have trusted Jesus knowing that they were gonna get to the other side. Um, but that's easy for us to say. What would you have done? What would I have done if we were facing their peril going across the sea? Um, uh, the mission was to get across the sea. They should have trusted, but they didn't. But that's one of the things you and I can remember and learn from this. When the Lord sends us on the mission, gives you the assignment, his commandments are his enablements. He'll give you the resources, the strength, the wherewithal, whatever you need to, to, to fulfill that mission if he gives that commandment. That's kind of a cool thing. So there's some good missions you and I have been given. We could talk about going to all the world, preach the gospel. That's a commandment of the Lord. Or love one another. That's a commandment of the Lord. Well, I don't know if I can do it. His commandments are his enablements. Like these are things that we can do because they were his commandments. So um, all that to say, we, we, number one, we kind of look at this as the mission, number one. Number two, uh, so that's, that's the first verse we looked at, verse 22. Going to next verse, verse 23, we see the isolation. What's that? Well, notice here, and I always find it interesting that Jesus, who's God in the flesh, Emmanuel, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I and my Father are one. Isn't it interesting that Jesus saw it important to take time away? We see that when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Why did Jesus need to pray? And this is where the mystery of the Trinity gets very dizzying. Who was Jesus talking to when he prayed? Well, the Father. Yeah, but Jesus said, I and my Father are one, uh, and how does that work out? Um, the math is hard for us because I think God is bigger than our brain and bigger than our laws of physics and all that stuff. But as it turns out, Jesus takes time to, to seek the Lord in isolation. Um, it says that, that he was there alone. In fact, that's where he ended up in end of verse 23. When the evening was come, he was there alone. And my simple truth that we can glean from this little verse, the isolation that Jesus saw fit to have, I think if Jesus needed time away, how much more do you need time away? And then the next question is, when was the last time you carved out time just to spend with the Lord? You know, it's funny, even 20 years ago, um, if I would ask that, I would think, okay, that means you getting away from, you know, people and, and you know, things that are tempting with your time and, you know, stuff that are distracting. So go out in the woods somewhere or have a little quiet room in your house that you kind of close all the doors and spend time praying, whatever that looked like. But today, there's a whole nother element you also have to consider, and that is disconnect from your iPhone, uh, from your technology. Uh, like the time alone, I think, also includes shutting down your technology. Because I've noticed there's a thing where, where, man, we have the world in our pocket now with our iPhones and stuff. And, you know, there's texts and people talking to you and stuff going on. And I just, what was the last time you just literally disconnected uh, for a length of time and just said, I'm gonna seek the Lord and, and spend time in prayer. If Jesus needed to do it, we need to do it. And if you're stressed out or full of anxiety or things aren't working out very well in your life, that might be one thing you could just check. When was the last time I really spent time away seeking the Lord? The isolation was part of this story. It's a good lesson for us to remember. Um, well, all that to say, that brings us to number three. We come into the tribulation. Prep the great tribulation? Nope. Remember, Jesus talked about in this world, you will have tribulation. That's, that's a promise. We'll, we'll go through difficult times. Um, and that's what the disciples are now facing, um, trials and tribulation. And this is, this is in, the, in the way of a, of a storm. Uh, 
You know, storms are troubling. You know, um, for our watch parties over in Florida, we're all praying for you guys. It's amazing how that category one hurricane just a couple days ago went through Florida and did so much damage. Did you guys see that? You don't think of a category one as doing something, but man, I saw some footage. It looked like the category five or whatever, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, storms, storms are bad enough and real, but, but the storms of life, we all go through them. Um, and no one is, um, you know, completely isolated from storms or troubles. But trials and tribulations part of the deal. And so in this case, it's the Sea of Galilee. This is a, uh, I showed this footage a while ago, but I want to remind you, the Sea of Galilee or the, you know, it's a small, it's, it's, a, it's a good sized lake is what we would call it. Um, but um, it's fun as AC Creekers, we go out on a boat there on the sea. And it's almost hard to picture, but I have been there when the waves were three or four feet tall. And you say, well, Brett, you could take your jet ski out and have fun on that. Uh, well, that's not scary. But put yourself in this boat. This is there at the Nafgenosar Kibbutz where they found a first century boat from the time of Jesus. There's a model of it there. But the actual wood and nails and everything is found. They've, got, they've, they've preserved this, this boat from the first century. Uh, they call it the Jesus boat because it was from his time period. Uh, but when I look at this boat and the way it was built, I know it's dilapidated from 2,000 years of deterioration, but still, it doesn't look like a great plan if you're asking me to go out into the sea uh, with that. Uh, like, I'd, I'd rather have like a, one of those inflatable uh, things for your pool. Uh, you'd probably be safer uh, than, than being in this. But no wonder, when it says a big ship, this is what the Bible is talking about here. And we do teachings there about the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of fun when we go to this place. But, um, but all that to say, I wanted you to kind of take a look at this boat just to remind you, this is why it's a problem. You're out in the middle of a sea. The Jews were not big on water, swimming, any of that stuff. They had great fear of the depths. That's why in the Bible, you have all these scary scriptures about the depths of the sea. Um, like if you offend a little child, um, you know, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the depth of the sea. Jesus was saying stuff that freaked them out, um, as it should us, as we, as a nation, pretty much signed on to the abortion thing uh, tragically on Tuesday. Uh, heartbreaking to see the hard-heartedness of our nation. Um, but that's the idea. If you offend a little one, you're gonna have a millstone tied around. It'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea. And that's the kind of stuff that freaked the Jews out. So here they are in, a, in this boat, kind of wondering what in the world's going on. And this is where the tribulation, the trial, the trick comes. By the way, on the Sea of Galilee, the, the wind howls through this canyon at the north region, and it blows through and it causes that venturi kind of effect where the, 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 the wind speeds up as it shoots across the Sea of Galilee. And that's why actually sizable waves and storms do in fact hit the Sea of Galilee in quite a radical way. It starts to raise a question. Why does the Lord allow us to go through trials and troubles, storms, tribulation? Why does he allow us to go through that? Um, uh, I think there's a few things we should think about, perhaps, that um, might be important for us to think about on this particular verse uh, in this lesson. Um, so why? Number one, I think sometimes he allows us to go through these things for instruction. Um, pardon me, for correction. Uh, to teach us to go the right direction. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting one. Uh, just ask Jonah. Jonah was a guy, you know, God said, go. Jonah said, No. And Jonah went the opposite direction of where God wanted him to go. So what did the Lord send? A storm to basically correct his course. He was going away from where God wanted him. You remember the story. The storm came and the ship was starting to break apart. And finally they said, get rid of this guy. So they threw him overboard. And then, you know, he got swallowed by a big fish, barfed on the beach, went and preached hesitatingly. And the whole city got saved. And then he went and pouted. Um, it's kind of an amazing story in the book of Jonah. But all that to say, the Lord used a storm in Jonah's life to correct his course. And I think the Lord uses storms for correction. But he also uses storms sometimes for our instruction, uh, to help us learn, maybe to trust in the Lord, maybe to not keep our eyes on the waves, but keep our eyes, like there's so many lessons we can learn through the storms. And, and like I said, Stormology 101, Matthew chapter eight, the first storm. Stormology 102, but the question is, what would be storm number 103 or, or class number 103 for the, the disciples? Or would they ever make you college people? Would they ever make the 400 level classes? Well, the, the disciples, yes. The disciples, there'd be a time in their life, I bet they were wishing they were back on the Sea of Galilee in a storm with Jesus uh, later on because they would hit trials and tribulation like none of us have ever seen. 
after Jesus died and rose from the grave, waves of persecution. There were 10 waves of persecution that rolled through the church and it was a horrifying part of church history. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs if you haven't seen that. It's something I think every Christian should see of what our early brothers and sisters went through uh, in their early parts of the church. It was radical. Uh, you know, and even the disciples themselves. You know, Simon Peter was, um, you know, crucified on a cross only upside down around 68 AD by uh, Caesar Nero in Rome. James the Lesser, who was the son of Alphaeus, um, he uh, was in his early 90s, uh, and they, they, the church history tells us he was thrown down from the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem where he hit the ground and then they threw rocks and smashed his brains in with a club. Like, that's a horrible demise. Andrew, the brother of Peter, um, uh, was bound, not nailed, but bound to an X-shaped cross um, uh, uh, in southern Greece. And he hung there on this X-shaped cross for two days, and the whole time he was preaching from that X-shaped cross as what people walked by. He was preaching salvation through Jesus Christ. Philip um, is said to have been tortured, impaled by iron hooks, in his ankles, and then hung upside down to die, also preaching uh, there to, uh, to his death in 54 AD in uh, Heliopolis, Egypt. Uh, and he preached in Phrygia and also Roman province. Uh, he went all over preaching, but he ultimately died a, a torturous death. Like we could go on and on. These guys, these, these disciples of Jesus, these were just, this is a storm, Stormology 101, 102. But uh, they were gonna hit some big storms, but they would be ready for those and equipped because the Lord was using these storms as uh, instruction. But also the storm the Lord uses for revelation. When do they see Jesus in his power and his might? They see him in the storm. Just ask you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when did those guys, Old Testament guys, see Jesus? They saw him in the fiery furnace. It's in the tribulation time, the trouble, you see Jesus the clearest. And by the way, when will the Jews see Jesus the clearest? During the great tribulation that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. That's when the Jews, their eyes will be opened and they'll see Jesus clearly. In this case, in our text here, in verse 24, um, we see tribulation as they're going through this time. But why does the Lord allow them to go through this? I think these are three possible reasons. There's plenty more we could talk about, but those are the things we should remember. When you're going through difficult times, what is the Lord doing? Is he correcting you or is he instructing you or is he revealing himself to you? What is the Lord doing? It's good for us to see why we go through those things. So that's number four, uh, number three. Number four, the solution to the problem. I love this. This is a simple one, verse 25. Uh, it says there in verse 25, and in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And I, I like to just add to this point and make note, Jesus is the answer. He's always the answer. The disciples are in trouble, Jesus is the answer. Remember old Andre Crouch's song? I grew up listening to this, it was playing on records in my house when I was a little kid. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. Um, and that's the truth. So Jesus, you almost hear the sound, dun, 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 as Jesus comes into this picture and he's uh, walking on the sea, we see Jesus as the solution. But before we leave this point, they didn't see Jesus as the solution, they saw him as a ghost. Interesting, isn't it? That they didn't recognize him right out of the gate. Sometimes it's hard to recognize the solution that God is providing. Um, sometimes we might even see it. These disciples thought, okay, what could be worse? We're toiling on the sea, drowning, going, our ship is you know, filling up with water, and there's a ghost coming at us. Like, what could be worse? But it wasn't a ghost, they just missed it. Um, the solution is always Jesus. The question you should ask yourself is, what are the storms you're facing? And you're looking for a solution, but could it be the solution is simply Jesus? Looking to, trusting in, keeping your eyes on Jesus? Because that's the answer for this one. Um, and I think oftentimes that's the answer for your storm that you're going through right now. Keep your eyes on Jesus, that's what we're told to do. So you've got the mission the isolation, the tribulation, the solution, and then comes the trepidation, huh? That's just a big word for uh, extreme fear or severe uh, fear. I mean, here's some experienced fishermen. 
Uh, and these guys have been in this boat. They've been doing this. A lot of these guys are experienced fishermen. Um, but now they're all shrieking in fear. We see that um, here. Uh, in fact, if we sneak preview what's going on, did you see in verse 26 at the end, um, it says uh, uh, they thought it was a spirit, so they cried out for fear. Like what makes big fishermen cry out like little girls on a boat? Uh, ah! Like like this is, a, I, I wonder if they got back to the shore like, Peter, I saw you whimpering uh, there on the boat. Like, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. You shrieked in fear and horror. Uh, and we heard you screaming like a little girl. Um, I don't know if they argued about that, but um, it's funny how fear makes you do kind of goofy things. Here they are shrieking because they think a ghost is coming to them on the water. And uh, again, it's easy to sit here and joke about that. But uh, oftentimes, fear makes you do weird things. It's like the story I, I heard of, you know, the, the two men that were, you know, working for the gas company. They were servicemen, a senior training supervisor and the younger trainee. And they were going in a suburb neighborhood, looking at all the gas meters, reading them and all that. Well, uh, they parked their truck at the end of the street and they walked around and did this. And at the last one, the younger guy said, hey, I bet I can beat you to the truck. And the older guy said, no way, $10, you know. And so pure, they both took off running. Well, as they were running, they were getting closer to their truck racing when suddenly this lady in curlers and a robe and her house shoes was running next to them, same speed. Like they all looked and saw this lady and said, what are you, what are you doing? She says, well, all I know is when you see two gas men running for their lives, I think you should run too. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, fear makes you do silly things. We have seen this in the last two years, three years of our you know, fears of the, you know, the coronavirus and what fear has caused people to do, it makes us all kind of look silly sometimes. Um, when really we're not to be given over to a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is what the Lord has called us to do. But these guys are gonna have to learn that fear and trepidation is something that they could put their trust in, know that Jesus was right there. Um, so all that, the very, the very thing that, that they were afraid of most, the ghost, uh, was the very thing that would be their solution, the answer to their fears. Uh, I think that's interesting. Don't be shocked, by the way, if the Lord brings the solution to your storm that you're going through in a very unlikely way. Uh, that's one thing I've noticed the Lord does, just like this story. Who would have thought the answer would be Jesus walking on the water, uh, coming to them and saying, hey, it's all good. Everything's gonna work out great. So number five, the trepidation. Number six, we then see the instruction in verse 27. I love this, this verse, this is probably my favorite verse in the whole story. It's verse 27, but straightway Jesus spake to them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Three point sermon right there. You could do a whole sermon on this and spend a whole time just on this verse. Um, I love this, he says, be of good cheer. If, if you're kind of a logical person, you might think maybe they should have said, uh, he should have changed the or order a little bit. Uh, like, it is I, be not afraid, be of good cheer. Like, that's the more logical order if you ask me. Why would Jesus say, be of good cheer? Uh, it is I, be not afraid. Uh, the, um, the answer, I think, is that one of the things a mature Christian does is they are of good cheer before they hear the answer or see the solution. That's the, the, the believer that's a little more squared away, maybe, uh, than some of the others. A person who just has joy, even though they don't know what the answer is to their situation. Um, I, I love that about Jesus. Jesus was, was a guy that seemed to be upbeat. He wasn't Eeyore, he was more of a Tigger. Oh, Brent, I saw the movies. I think he looked like Charles Manson. Um, well, that's the movies. Uh, and they've, they, Jesus, well, he was full of joy. Even when he went to the cross, it was the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross, despising the shame. In fact, one of the great messianic psalms about Jesus in the Old Testament is Psalm 45, verse seven, that says, thou lovest righteous, hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. This is talking about Jesus, who is anointed with the oil of gladness. And by the way, I always like to bring this up. Um, kids would not run up to Charles Manson and wanna sit on his lap. Kids are a great character judge, you know, and kids were always running up to Jesus, wanting to hang out with Jesus. The disciples were the grouchy ones saying, get these kids out of here. And Jesus said, no, let the kids come unto me. Um, this was the kind of guy Jesus was. Um, and he chose, you know, he, 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 that's who he was. And I think one of the things that Jesus says here is be of good cheer first. Before you have the solution, um, you need to just be of good cheer. Um, 
I've seen this, by the way. I've seen this in people over the years, and it's a real shocker. You see people that are dealing with really tough things, like cancer, or sickness, or death, or financial, you know, uh, ruin, or fill in the blank. And I've seen Christians that are just kind of that next level. Um, I've, how many times have I gone to the hospital to visit someone who's, you know, deathly sick? And I go there to, as pastor, go and encourage and share the word with them and try to encourage them. But how many times have I walked away being the one encouraged? Um, the, the, the people that I've seen, uh, man, I can tell you stories of people that were given, you know, a one month to live and how they just beamed with joy. How is that possible? I've seen doctors and nurses scratching their heads going, why is this person so at peace? Because they see that all the time. People dealing with death, facing death. How is it that, I think the Christian that just says, you know what, I'm gonna be of good cheer because I know the Lord's in control. Be of good cheer first, it is I, be not afraid. That's what Jesus' instruction was. Maybe it'd be helpful for you to say, you know what, I'm gonna choose to be of good cheer. Well, what if my heart doesn't feel happy um, and my, I'm trying to act like I'm, be, remember, you change your mind and, the, and then the, let the Lord change your heart. That's what you gotta do. So Jesus gives them that same instruction. Be of good cheer, it is I. That's the reason they can be of good cheer. And be not afraid. That's what he wanted to get out of it. That once you realize Christ is with you, you've got nothing to fear. Be of good cheer. Um, so that's the instruction. Number seven. See, I told you we're gonna rip through these. The action. This is where the action starts taking place. Uh, you can almost uh, you know, sense the tension in verse 28 when suddenly Peter answers him and says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. You ever wondered why Peter asked this? Like, why did he want to go out? Why, did, why wouldn't he say, Jesus, come on into the boat here. And, uh, give us a hand or uh, make the storm go away while we're in the boat. Why did Peter want to go out? And the answer is, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, there's a hint. I'll show you a verse here in a second that shows you a little bit of why or part of what he's doing. But uh, maybe it was just cool. Wow, Jesus is walking on the water. I would like to walk on the water. Can I come out and walk on the water? And Jesus says, yes. Maybe it was just because it was really cool. It was like, what a neat trick. Can I do that? And Jesus says, yeah. Or maybe, maybe he, he sensed the, the boat stinky and with a bunch of sweaty fishermen toiling, trying to make it stay afloat. Maybe he sensed it was going down. He thought, wow, Jesus looks more comfortable than we are. Can I go out to you? Maybe he wanted to go to Jesus uh, because the boat was more of an escape. Get me out of this boat where we're definitely going down. But isn't it funny, if you know the story, he ends up back in the boat. I've found that some of you are escapists. You're in a predicament and you think, I wanna get out of this situation. So pure, out you go, only to end up back in that same position. That, that happens to us. Well, that happens to Peter. Um, maybe he didn't know what else to do. Uh, what am I gonna do? We're going down, fear, freaking out, thinking there was a ghost. And like, can I go to you, Jesus? Maybe that, he's just knee jerk, I don't know. But minimally, he says this, I wanna do what Jesus is doing. And you gotta give Peter credit for this. <clears throat> I love this about Peter, by the way, that he was the one disciple who was willing to get out of a perfectly good boat and go out and walk with Jesus. Like, I, like, I'm impressed by that. I think Peter gets a lot of bad press on this one. Yeah, Peter, what a loser. He got out of the boat and started sinking and the end. No, but Peter was the guy who said, get me out, I wanna go boardless. I'm gonna go out in the waves with Jesus and I'm gonna walk on the water. Like, you gotta give Peter some credit here for being willing to do that. Um, so minimally, he's saying, I wanna do what Jesus is doing. But then at, the, uh, at verse 29, if you notice, it says, um, Jesus said, come, and Peter was uh, come down to, out of the ship, and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So that's the main thing we learn from the Bible, is that Peter wanted to go to Jesus, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you, gotta, you gotta love that, um, to go to Jesus. John 14, verse 12, says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. This is an interesting verse that Jesus gave us um, in John 14. And first of all, let me make sure and clarify what this is not. Is this verse Jesus saying, um, you're gonna do greater th works than me, so then we can be greater than Jesus. Is that what he's saying? 
You guys are making me real nervous. Let me, let me ask this again. Does this verse mean that you can be greater than Jesus? Thank you, thank you. The reason I, I ask that is because there's pastors in this town teaching that, that if you just uh, do the, the greater things, you're, by the Holy Spirit, you're gonna do greater things than Jesus. And, and then there's an implication that you are gonna be greater than Jesus then. Anybody that says that, that's heretical teaching. There's no one of us that are gonna even come close to Jesus. That what does this verse say? You'll be able to do greater things um, as long as you do what? Believe on Jesus. Hello? You gotta believe on Jesus. And then the works that I do, you're gonna be able to do that also. Now that's pretty cool, but that doesn't make you better than or greater than Jesus. Well, then it says greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. The point is Jesus said, you're gonna do greater works because I'm leaving. I'm limited to this three years of ministry on this earth. But when I am with my church in this power of the Holy Spirit, then for centuries, millennia, the church is gonna do the great works that I, that I have done here. And it's gonna be greater in the sense of numerically greater works. Not that any of us are gonna be greater than Jesus. That's an important thing. There's a trend right now, and I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. If you see anybody minimalizing Jesus in any way, shape, or form, you gotta run from that kind of Bible teaching. That's really erroneous to sort of put yourself better than Jesus or that Jesus did something wrong or that you're gonna do greater, you're gonna be greater than Jesus. You, you gotta watch out for that language. Um, so that's a big nope. Can you be greater than Jesus? No, no, no. Uh, but great things will you do if you believe on Jesus and the works that you see Jesus do, you're gonna do that also. And the reason I bring that up is that's exactly what Peter's doing. He sees Jesus walking on the water and says, I wanna do that. And you can't knock Peter for that. Um, so you and I can, as we believe on Jesus, what we start to do is understand you, you will be able to be used by the Lord to do great things um, if you believe on Jesus, that's the key. So that's where the action is, believing on Jesus and that's where Peter jumps out, starts walking on the water and you gotta love that. So that's verse, um, verse 28. Um, and so before he jumps out though, there's something that you need to note. And we see that in the next verse, verse 29, we have number eight, the invitation. Before you just mindlessly go off and do some great thing for Jesus, one thing you might wanna look for is confirmation. Um, where you actually uh, seek the Lord and say, Lord, is this what you want me to do? I love Peter for this. He says, Lord, if, if you want, I will come out and walk on the water. And then verse 29, I love it. It says, and Jesus said, come. And when Peter come, uh, was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. And I love this because he waited for, um, you know, he, he got the invitation. Um, uh, and, and then he waited for that, you know, for, for the com confirmation where Jesus said, come. You know, when Deb and I were praying about moving to Portland and starting a church, we, we had our hearts stirred. We were excited about the idea, but it was a big leap. You know, I didn't know anybody up here. We were from Southern Oregon, grew up, born and raised, basically. I was born in California, but really spent most of my life in Southern Oregon. All our friends were there, um, and it was a big thing to move. But um, I remember seeking the Lord, Lord, do you want us to go? And it was so cool how the Lord just confirmed uh, by a couple things. First, through his word, one thing, you're, when you're looking for confirmation, look into the scripture. When you read your Bible, you'll see scriptures that confirm what you're wondering about. It's really cool how the Lord does that. But another thing that happens is he, he confirms through other trusted believers. Uh, there were other brothers that I, that I would lean on uh, that I was growing up with that I would say, hey man, what do you think? There was one guy who was one of the elders of the church, didn't know I was praying about moving to Portland. And it was one of those moments, and he wasn't like this holy, deeply spiritual guy. He just walked up and said, Brett, I don't know what it is, but the Lord put it on my heart. This is not the kind of language this guy would normally say. He said, the Lord put it on my heart to tell you whatever you're praying about, the word the Lord put on my heart is go. And he didn't know, I was right on the cusp of making the decision of moving to Portland. It was just one of those moments, you just kind of go, wow, this is like the Lord confirming um, what he wanted for us to do. Um, look for that. Before you go, you know, ventures of faith, even Jonathan and his armor bearer looked for confirmation, didn't he? I mean, this is a great uh, story of the Old Testament. First Samuel, Jonathan wakes up early, wakes up his armor bearer and says, hey, I think we should go fight some Philistines, just you and me. And the armor is like, cool. So they go off. But remember, he said, but if the Lord's in this, when we reveal ourselves to the Philistines, they'll say, you guys come up here and we'll show you a thing or two. And we'll climb up the cliff and fight them. 
But if they say, you guys wait right there, we're coming after you, then we need to run because that's the Lord saying, it's not gonna be a good thing. And so they go through that. And of course, the story goes where the Philip says, you guys get up here, we'll show you a thing or two. And, and Jonathan climbs up and just him and his armor wipes out the whole army. It's this beautiful, amazing battle of the Old Testament. There was a guy who um, felt his heart stirred and he uh, asked the Lord and said, should I go? And the Lord confirmed. Uh, that's always the way it works. So you have the mission, the isolation, the tribulation, the solution, the trepidation, the instruction, the action, the invitation where Jesus said, come. And now you have number nine, the distraction. The distraction, one of the things that the enemy wants to do is get your eyes off of Jesus and onto your troubles. And that's what happens, poor Peter, verse 30. Uh, he was doing so good in verse 29. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. Again, I give Peter credit. He, he walked on water. He's the only guy in the world that's ever done that other than Jesus. Uh, so let's give him credit uh, there in verse 29. Um, but I also give him credit for when he started sinking. He still knew what to do. He cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, save me. That's where the rescue would actually come. And, um, you know, it might be your temptation to keep your eyes on your trouble are you one of those people that go through tribulation and trouble and you just keep focusing and your mind is obsessing about the problem? The key is to fix your eyes on Jesus. I'm reminded of Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Don't forget that. When you're facing troubles, don't look at your trouble. Look at the, the author and the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Um, I, love the, I love the book of Philippians because it's a book about joy. 19 times Paul used the word rejoice or joy in his little epistle to the, to the Philippians. He, he loved the Philippian church. Now, when you read the church letters to the church at Corinth, uh, they were kind of prickly. Uh, Paul didn't seem to really love the, the Corinthian church quite as much. He, he kind of gushed over the Philippians. But I love it because here's Paul writing this beautiful book about joy. But where was Paul at that moment? He was sitting in a prison cell in Rome. Like who writes a book about joy and rejoicing from prison, about to be uh, you know, beheaded by Caesar Nero? Um, and the answer is joy is not dependent upon circumstances. That's what Paul knew, but they're dependent on the person of Jesus, keeping your eyes, looking to Jesus, the author, the perfecter of our faith. Um, and that's what Philippians, he wrote to the Philippian church saying this in verses uh, six through seven in chapter four, he said, be anxious about or careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, and I love this phrase, which passes all understanding. All you logical people who say, well, that doesn't work out mathematically, who cares? When you have the peace that, that God gives, not as this world gives, but it's a different kind of peace that Jesus gives, he says, which passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, that's the key. That's what Peter's learning here in this storm story. He, he, as long as he was looking at Jesus, he was doing great. As soon as he looked at the storm, he started sinking, and then he cried out, Lord, save me, and then Jesus reached out and pulled him up. <laughs> I love that. Uh, if you take the, the next uh, verse after this, uh, in fact, the NIV, I like it, because it says, finally, brothers and sisters, what's, what, what, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Keep your mind stayed on those things. And as we often remind you, those are the, the um, if you take the acronym, those spell, you know, true, noble, teener plap. Just remember to teener plap. <laughs> uh, teener plap them. I remember when my kids were growing up and they're crouchy and walking around the house. I'd say, kids, don't forget to teener plap. And they knew that meant Philippians chapter four, verse eight. You gotta start thinking about what is true what is you know, noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, praiseworthy, um, teeter plot. Anyway, that's, that's a whole nother teaching. Well, anyway, whatsoever you see waves over your head, don't forget the waves that are going over your head, they're still under his feet. Uh, don't forget that. He is in control. Uh, number 10, see, we're just really blowing through these 12 points. So you guys, are you guys still with me? I see that scary glazed look a little bit. It makes me nervous. 
Uh, okay, so then we see the beautiful salvation. Uh, number 10 on our list here, verse 31. It says, uh, and immediately um, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, I don't think Jesus said this, loser. I don't think he was condemning Peter. I think he's identifying the problem. Uh, it's almost like, uh, I want to learn how to walk in water. Oh, come, come out and learn. Uh, then, then when it didn't work, it's like if you're taking a golf lesson and somebody's saying, well, your swing is kind of off. Uh, that's why you're you know, slicing it every single time. Um, that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. The reason you're saying is because you doubted. Where, oh, oh, you know, where, oh, of little faith, where, where did you doubt? Where did you start doubting? And we know the answer when he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the problem. But I love how Jesus um, was his salvation uh, and it got him through that. By the way, um, one of the things about Jesus that I'd like to note here, Jesus took Peter and put him back in the boat. Was Jesus a physically strong guy? Or was he the toothpick that looked like Charles Manson that I mentioned earlier? Um, I think Jesus was a bigger guy. Let me explain. Uh, remember the table turning there in Jerusalem when he made a whip of small cords and started flipping tables? Not one guy said, hey, what do you think you're doing? Uh, you want some of this? Like nobody said, I'll meet you at the Southern Steps, come on. <laughs> like nobody said that. They all just kind of ran for their lives. And Jesus said, take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Nobody crossed Jesus. Why? I think he was a f physically maybe bigger, more intimidating kind of guy in that way. Um, and, and not only that, um, uh, he was a skilled carpenter and he used you know, saws and didn't have a skill saw with electricity or anything. Um, you know, he was accused, by the way, of being a glutton, um, which is interesting. Now, falsely accused of that. Um, Brad, I know what you're doing. You're trying to make Jesus in your image. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not. That would be wrong of me to do that. But I think the Bible does sort of imply that they, they accused him of eating too much. Um, I wonder if he was just a bigger guy. Um, Peter was, in fact, a bigger guy. We know that from several things, both history and the Bible. Um, I love that story uh, that John the Apostle, when he writes, he writes himself like he's the, in the third person or whatever. Um, when Peter and John run to the tomb on Resurrection Sunday, um, uh, if you remember John 20, verse four, so they, both, both Peter and John, ran together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. Um, some of you are like, who cares who made it first? Uh, well, apparently John the Apostle wanted to make sure everybody throughout all of history, I beat Peter. Peter was last. Um, I, so we know, and by the way, in church history outside of the Bible, they called Peter the giant. Did you know that? That was like their nickname, Peter the giant, because he was a big guy. So picture the big guy Peter sinking and Jesus just kind of bicep curling him up and, and putting him back in the boat. Uh, I just pictured Jesus was a little bigger. And, and you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I think minimally we often sell Jesus short of physical strength. But more importantly and more dastardly, we sell Jesus short in spiritual strength. I don't know if Jesus, even Jesus can help me with my situation. Want to bet? Jesus is all powerful. He, Jesus was there at creation. Um, like we mentioned earlier, the mystery of the Trinity, Jesus, Jesus is uh, the same one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. So don't sell Jesus short um, uh, strength-wise to be able to pull you up out of your quagmire or your trouble or your storm. Pulled Peter right out of the storm, plopped him back in the ship, didn't even break a sweat, uh, which is pretty cool. So that's the salvation in verse 31. Two more, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, number 11, verse 32, the subjection, yes. Notice that the, that the clouds and the wind and the rain was, would be subject to Jesus. Um, we don't see that as clearly in this particular narrative, but we do see it in verse 32. When they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Um, it's like Jesus had total control over everything. It's all stormy and waning. There, Peter gets all in that situation and he gets everybody back in the, in the boat and all of a sudden everything stops. Um, we know from the other stories, um, like in Matthew chapter eight, the one we read a few weeks ago, um, in that storm, it says, but, when the, but the men marveled saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Um, and so this would be the second demonstration in Matthew 14, 
that even the wind and the waves are subject to Jesus. Jesus is, is powerful over all things. Don't forget that. Some, some of you might think, well, the Lord's just, it's not strong enough to, to uh, take my situation, save me out of my certain doom. Um, well, the answer is nope. All things are subject to him. Uh, and that brings us to the last and final uh, part of the story, the exaltation. Verse 33. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the son of God. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Well, this is the opposite of that. This is where the, the disciples were like, yeah, you're the son of God. This is it. And, and then they worshiped him, it says here. And I, I think that's the key. When you find yourself um, out of the storm, when the, you know, one of the things we forget to do, it's like the, remember the, the 10 lepers that came and Jesus cleansed the 10 and nine of them just took off, pure, never to be seen again. But the one came back and said, uh, by the way, thank you. One came back thankful and, you know, giving glory to Jesus for the healing. I wonder how many of us miss the fullness of what the Lord would have because we, we, we get out of the storm and not only do we not give glory to the, where credit is due to the Lord himself, but we think, oh, what a coincidence. The storm's over now. I guess I'm good. It wasn't that big a deal. And pure off we go in life, forgetting what God has done. That's why worship is so important. Any good parent's gonna teach their kids to be thankful. If at Christmas time you give your kids gifts and they all just kind of open the, the presents and then throw the st stuff on the side and just walk out of the room without saying anything, you'd be like, mm, we have some correction to do. Junior needs to learn to be thankful. Uh, if they're not thankful, then we're doing something wrong. In the same way, I think we Christians are little spoiled brats sometimes. We're in a storm, oh Lord, save me. And the Lord saves you like, okay, pew and off we go, and there's a little dust cloud uh, in our little puff, like in the cartoons, as we take off on our merry way. And we forget to, to uh, the exaltation, giving glory where glory is due. Um, you know, Jesus saves us. We need to remember to give him credit. That's why when you come to church on a Saturday night at six o'clock like this group, you gotta come ready to worship the Lord. He's done so much for us. We should be singing songs of praise and worshiping him. I love tonight how you guys, as soon as we started singing, I saw hands being lifted and people being thankful. That's what we need to be doing. And that's such a key part of what church is actually about, to gather and say, we're giving glory and honor to the one who deserves all the exaltation we can offer. Um, that's the Lord that we serve. So be ready with today's storm so that we can be prepared for tomorrow. Uh, whatever storms may come, the disciples, they thought this was a big deal in their life. It was, but wait till the next storms. These were all part of the things that the Lord was doing to prepare, to instruct, and to ready the disciples for future things. Maybe that's what the Lord's doing for you, for me. May the Lord give us ears to hear as we learn these 12 lessons from 12 verses in Jesus' name. Lord, we're thankful. What a great story, Lord, the, the story that just keeps on giving. We learn every time we read these stories these little nuances and all the little attributes of, of what it means to walk with you and to keep our eyes on you. Lord, I pray for your church that we would be a, a people that aren't easily distracted by the waves and the wind. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. Give this congregation strength, even in the midst of the storm, no matter what my brothers and sisters are going through here in this place. Lord, in their lives right now, I pray that they would put their trust in you, keep their faith dialed in, Lord, for you are the author, the perfecter. We keep, keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, let's stand. Well, there you have it. We'll uh, cover the rest of the chapter on Wednesday night. Love to see you there, but uh, before you go, say hi to some people around you, and then you're dismissed. God bless.